Hi, Anthony, can you hear me? Uh, yes, Dr. Priya. You are, you are muted, huh? you are okay now, right? I just saw you. <laughs> All right. I have, I have, hello. Hello. So I, I should, uh, okay. I should say that I have never done this before, but it looks like a very professional presentation you have here. Huh? Yes, yes, I hope so. We like to give everybody a chance to experience a bit of Los Angeles and campus as we get started. Very, very good. You have, you have, you have, <laughs> you have very good, uh, very good pictures, huh? I'm glad to hear it. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen for everyone. Thank you for those of you who've already joined. We're just going to allow one more minute for a few more to hop in and we'll get started. So how often do you do this? Um, we've been doing it now, actually, since the pandemic started, we've been doing these online for the last two years, but usually we did it in person. So you have done what, 20, 30, 40 of these? Yes. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Something like that. Sorry, one moment. Can you all see my the presentation here? Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you again, everyone, for joining today. My name is Jessica Stern. I'm part of the graduate recruitment team at the USC Viterbi School of Engineering. First and foremost, we want to congratulate all of you on your admission to USC. This is a big accomplishment. We're really excited to celebrate your achievements today and welcome you specifically to the Mork Family Department of Chemical Engineering and Material Science. I'm joined today by Professor Vashishta and Anthony, um, who are part of the department and will have a chance to, to to speak with you directly and introduce themselves, as well as one of our alums and current students um, who will share a little bit more about their experiences. But before I hand over the torch to them, I just want to go over a few basic information about um, the university, as well as some important reminders and deadlines to be aware of as admitted students. Um, so as we mentioned, welcome to the University of Southern California. As you all probably know by this point, we are a private research university located in Los Angeles. Uh, we're pretty large with more than 46,000 students at the university, um, but the School of Engineering itself um, has more than 6,000 students pursuing masters and PhDs alone. So of all the different um, schools within USC, and we are proud to be a comprehensive university giving you access to many, many different disciplines and events and resources, um, the School of Engineering does have the largest graduate student population. Um, and it's a very, very um, exciting community, 76,000 alumni worldwide, um, just from the School of Engineering. Um, we are a top engineering school, number 12, according to US New News and World Report. Um, and as a research university, research is very much at the core of what we do with 38 research centers in the School of Engineering alone. Um, you can see here it says engineering a better world for humanity. And I do want to highlight that point. It's something that's very um, dear to us at the Viterbi School, where all of the work we do, all the research we do is with the goal of addressing some of society's most pressing challenges today and of the future. Um, and you will find how this translates in the classroom and any research that you're a part of um, in the interdisciplinary work we do as well, because we do understand that it takes more than just engineering to, to achieve these um, solutions to some of the world's um, biggest challenges. So just some highlights about the School of Engineering. And hopefully some of you got to see some of the beautiful photos of Los Angeles, um, or maybe some of you have visited LA before, but if not, I do want to um, reiterate that this is a very dynamic city. It is a global hub for innovation, for business, arts, technology. Um, you will definitely make the most of our incredible weather. Uh, we do enjoy this Mediterranean climate year round. Um, there are many ways to enjoy yourself recreationally. There are mountains, there are beaches, there's the city. Um, but especially for you as engineers, I do want to highlight uh, what a strategic place it is to be for your 
for academic and professional development. Um, this map shows you where USC is situated, more or less close to downtown LA. And you can see um, by the ocean is an area known as Silicon Beach. Um, this is where kind of like an ecosystem of 500 plus startups, as well as uh, branch offices of many tech companies that are headquartered in Silicon Beach. Um, USC is very much um, involved with what's going on there, not only because we have research centers in that area, as you can see, ICT and ISI, um, that's the Institute of Creative Technologies and the Information Sciences Institute. But of course, we also have a lot of partnerships with employers um, all over Southern California and the country as a whole. In terms of career opportunities, kind of going along with what I was saying before, this is a great place for you to be. Um, you can see here by the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, Los Angeles is the number one metropolitan area with the highest employment level for materials engineers. And California is number two in the country for the highest employment level for chemical engineers and petroleum engineers. Um, you can see here a snapshot of the kind of companies our graduates go on to work at, um, and you can get a lot more detailed information about this, both on the Viterbi Graduate Admission website, as well as the Mork Family Department website, just to get an idea of the kinds of places where our alumni are currently working. Um, I briefly touched on this, but our community is very diverse. Uh, we have students from virtually every state in the country and more than 100 countries worldwide. And we are very excited to um, have such an enriching community contribute to the classroom, but also it's important to us that you thrive outside of the classroom. And so I do encourage you all to explore the many services and resources and programming and student organizations available to you based on your own interests and affiliations some resources to be aware of. You do have the ability to chat directly with some of our current student ambassadors. So right on our website, we have the chance for you to chat with these current students and learn a little bit more about their stories. They were in your position not too long ago, having to decide where to pursue graduate school and what made sense for them. Um, so I encourage you to chat with them and maybe get some of their tips and, and experiences at graduate student life at USC. A few other um, resources we want to make sure you're aware of. You can take a virtual tour of our campus. If you have not had the chance to visit before, it's a great way to kind of envision uh, what your life might be like here at the USC school. So please check out the virtual tour. We have um, great resources for you to check out what student organizations are available, safety, wellness. Um, I will make these slides available to you after today's presentation so you'll have a chance to explore these various web pages. Finally, if any of you are currently located in the United States, uh, we do have a campus event coming up next Friday that will allow you to experience campus, get to know your department, your advisor, current students. Um, so it's not too late to sign up for Visit Viterbi. Just check out on our website. You can still register and come and attend. Okay. Final things, fall deadline. So if you are um, an international student and still need to submit your financial documents, the last day to do that is April 15th. And only until you submit your financial documents are you able to receive your official letter of admission and proceed with the process of enrolling. For those of you who are not an international student or maybe you already submitted your financial documents, the last day to accept your admission offer is May 1st. And you do that on the USC portal. The sooner you submit the statement of intent, the sooner you have access to a lot of important resources in regards to your arrival to Los Angeles. So you'll be able to access information about orientation, about our mentorship program, which pairs you with current students who kind of help you navigate life at USC. Um, it allows you to connect with your departments and learn about course registration and start the process of your housing search. All very important things to get done as soon as possible. Um, so that just gives you a little bit of um, a preview, but now I really want to turn it over to um, my colleagues in the Moore Family Department of Chemical Engineering and Material Science. I will turn it over first to Dr. Priya Vashishta, who is a professor. Um, if Dr. Vashishta, please take it away. Oh, you are muted at the moment. 
Yes, so welcome to all of you to University of Southern California. It's a wonderful place to live and a great place to get a good education. And if you are doing masters, then more likely your goal is to find a good job after a good education. And California is the best place in the world to get a good and well-paid job. So what I will do is I will uh, request that you answer any questions you like. Uh, the department has three parts, chemical engineering, material science, and petroleum engineering. The courses you can take in any one of them, they are quite common. And my advice to you is to take advantage of the flexibility that the curriculum offers so that you can take the courses that you like depending on the career you want to pursue, okay? Uh, a simple thing that I will advise and I advise all students, <clears throat> take some courses in atomistic simulations because the world is becoming smaller and smaller and smaller and take a course in machine learning and all of these are offered in the department. And uh, it is easy to take courses outside the department and Anthony can help you in that. So with that, I will say, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer and you probably have many. And the last advice I have for you is review your math a little bit. It makes life easier in courses and it makes uh, learning enjoyable, okay? Okay. So with that, maybe Anthony wants to give some helpful advice regarding the department. Good evening, every, or depending on what time zone you're in. <laughs> um, hello. <laughs> uh, my name is Anthony Trito. I'm the director of the Mark Family Department of um, Chemical Engineering and Material Science. Um, we welcome you. We're excited to um, have you on board. Um, I assist in advising um, students across all of our master's programs, um, chemical engineering, our materials programs, including material science, materials engineering, and our newest program, uh, which is materials engineering with an emphasis in machine learning. So I'm sure some of you have heard about that program. Um, it's definitely getting a lot of buzz with our new and current students. Um, so I, I'm happy to facilitate questions regarding our materials programs and our petroleum engineering programs as well. There's a lot of um, different specializations, uh, such as in digital oil field management, our regular petroleum engineering track. Uh, so the possibilities are endless. Um, our faculty advisors are super resourceful um, and they assist in uh, providing professional development um, guidance. <clears throat> also um, resources as far as learning support if needed. Um, they're definitely well connected with the industry. So any type of advice that you're seeking for, um, you know, after your master's degree, definitely your faculty advisors and us as an academic advisors, uh, we're super um, helpful in, in getting you in touch and linked up with those resources as well. Um, I do have a, a brief presentation, uh, Jessica, that I could, okay. <laughs> um, let me go ahead and just pull that up really quickly here. Bear with me one second. Okay. And in the meantime, I do see we have a question for Dr. Vashishta. Um, you mentioned that students should prepare their math skills before starting. Someone asked if you could be more specific, linear algebra, calculus, what do you think? I'm so sorry, you're muted. How to differentiate first order and second order derivatives? simple vectors, matrices, their products, very, very simple stuff that you do as an undergraduate. And if you review that, it makes life a little bit easier in the earlier lectures, okay? And, uh, and enjoyable. So you could review it when you are now, you could review it when you come here. It, it, it would take probably five, 10 hours to do the whole thing. It'll make all the courses easy. It's a very good thing to do. Okay. And I have my presentation available. I could, yeah. Do I have access to sharing yes. my screen? Oh, okay, I just want to make sure. <laughs> All right. Anthony, if you don't mind, I actually got another question uh, oh. that you might be able to answer. Sure. Whether a student is able to complete the chemical engineering degree in a shorter amount of time, 
like in one and a half years, if possible? Yes. So um, it is possible. I mean, of course, as you may have heard, maybe from if you happen to know of current students, or if you have peers that are um, attending the chemical engineering program at SC, I mean, you know, the academic rigor is, is a bit intense. Uh, we normally recommend when you're starting off just to kind of uh, pursue the minimum amount of, of units that are required as a full-time student, um, which is uh, nine units. Um, but if you wanted to go above that, I mean, it is possible. We never recommend exceeding like over 12 because it's just, that's super intense. But if, if you wanted to schedule that, you know, maybe try it out in one semester, um, I mean, it's it's definitely possible, but as advisors, we would probably just ask, you know, some probing questions just to see, like, if you're managing your time effectively, just to see, you know, are you able to just focus on the classes themselves? Are you working right now? Are you involved in any kind of research or volunteer opportunities? Just because if you are trying to do that and trying to squeeze in 12 units at the same time, um, you know, we don't want you to experience any kind of fatigue or burnout like mid-semester. Um, you know, we always want to advocate for your self care as as students are concerned. So um, those are just some of the kind of vetting questions that we may ask. Um, but yeah, normally we just recommend perhaps just sticking with kind of two classes, at least in the beginning, to, I would say like two to three max, and then just kind of going from there, um, just to see, you know, if you're able to kind of, you know, keep up with the pace or add more classes to your enrollment plan. But as advisors, we'll guide you every step of the way. So so look, let, let me answer in more detail. Uh, Anthony, what is it? We have 28 credit hours for students to finish? Uh, for chemical engineering, at least, yes. So look at it this way. You have 28 credit hours, which is seven courses of four units each, right? So if you took two in first semester, you should not take more than two. Then you can make a judgment that in second semester, you could handle three. And in the third semester, you handle two because you might be interested in spending some time to look for a job. So to answer your question, you can absolutely do it in three semesters in one and a half year. And that should not be any problem, okay? As Duncan, he said, you require some discipline and make sure the courses you are taking, you have thought through and take time to ask students who have taken those courses. And we take very, very good care of our students here. So uh, unlimited amount of help is available to you from instructors. If you have problems, we, we arrange for help hours. Uh, hours on the, you, you can meet the, I mean, in my case, I teach on Zoom and I have almost unlimited amount of help hours on the Zoom sometime before the hour of the class, sometime after the hour of the class, sometime on weekends, and late evening for international students. So that, that part you shouldn't worry. You will be very, very, very well taken care of here. Thank you, Dr. Vashista. Um, I'll go ahead and uh, just kind of cover briefly. This is a presentation that we normally give during our um, graduate uh, student orientation which usually happens in the summer. Um, and I don't wanna take up too much time, but this kind of just provides you an overview of our programs and services that we offer as advisors. Um, so we're gonna be covering a few different items. Uh, some of the slides I won't go into too much detail because they're more tailored for when, um, you know, you're registering for classes and what type of admin process are, processes are involved, excuse me as far as like clearances are concerned to, for enrolling in certain classes, et cetera. Um, but again, this is just kind of a brief overview of the department as a whole. And also it's specific to our uh, master's programs and the advising resources that we have to offer students. Um, we do wanna introduce you to um, our, uh, our faculty. Um, starting on the left, we have Dr. Andrea Hodge, who's the department chair of the Mark Family Department. Uh, we have Dr. Noah Malmstad, who's the Associate Chair of um, MFD. Uh, we have Dr. Irajar Shaghi, who's the Director of the Petroleum Program. And we have D Diana Vuong, who's the Department Business Manager um, for our department as well. Um, we also have Dr. Kenichi Nomura, who is our Faculty Advisor uh, for the Materials Program, who is not pictured here. Um, and Dr. Irajar Shaghi, aside from being the director of the petroleum program, he's very hands-on with the petroleum master's students as well. 
So chances are, if you know, you're a petroleum master's student, and I know Elena, you could attest to this too, um, <laughs> he'll be kind of guiding you very closely as far as like what classes you need to enroll in, um, as far as kind of like professional resources you can take advantage of, <clears throat> um, events that happen in petroleum as well. So he's very connected and just a very great resource uh, to know as part of the petroleum program. Dr. Noel Malmstad is um, your contact if you're in chemical engineering. So oftentimes as um, academic advisors, we'll defer to him for any specific questions regarding like chemical engineering curriculum, um, or if maybe you have questions about doing like a course substitution, if you took like a chemical engineering class at a prior school and you're looking to like apply that towards your program here, et cetera. So Dr. Noel Malmstad is the, the faculty advisor again for um, chemical engineering. This is our academic advising team. So you know me, Anthony, director of the Morick Family Department. I'm also an academic advisor for our PhD students, um, master's level students, and our undergraduate students. Um, and we have Karen Wu, who's the assistant director for student affairs. She advises undergraduate and graduate students. So you may hear from her from time to time as well at the master's level. And we have Jordan Laffin, um, her primary population is um, undergrads, but at the same time, she does assist at the admin level uh, with graduate students as well. So you may hear from her, um, you know, um, regarding like events that happen at the department level. Um, and also she assists with um, updating our social media platform as well. Um, in case anyone would like to schedule appointments with us, that's all managed through uh, Calendly. So some of you may be familiar with that, uh, depending on how you scheduled appointments at your previous school. Uh, but basically, um, if you ever want to uh, make an appointment with your advisor, um, it would be through our Calendly pages. You could see our schedules there. You could schedule appointments in half hour increments, whether that's virtual or in person. It really just depends on your preference. Um, the below information is for the current semester, so definitely, um, you know, if you have planned to, to attend the master's student orientation before the fall semester starts, it'll be updated with uh, the most current fall information, so I just kind of want to give that disclosure here. Just to give you an overview of um, our student populations, we have about 170 students at the undergraduate level about 120 students um, at the master's level and about 100 students who are enrolled in our PhD programs. Um, you know, so we definitely are, you know, um, a smaller department in comparison to like computer science or electrical engineering. Uh, we are small, but I like to say we're mighty and we're all very united. <laughs> and, I, you know, I think one thing that I'm really proud of our students, well, uh, there's a lot of things, but the thing I'm proud about them the most is that how well um, connected they are. Um, as far as, you know, staying connected, especially during the height of the pandemic, a lot of students, um, you know, during that time when they were facing kind of adverse situations, you know, stayed connected, uh, formed study groups uh, virtually, you know, through Zoom, Google Chat, and they're still doing, implementing that same system. Um, a lot of students get together and reserve study spaces in the USC libraries. Um, and so that's another kind of um, way that students feel supported. Uh, everyone has different learning styles and they find that to be super useful, especially with master's level classes. Um, and so uh, students from across our various programs tend to do that. We have about um, seven uh, different master degree programs, four in petroleum engineering and one graduate certificate program. A lot of our students pursue um, different paths and research that have to do with energy, sustainability, petroleum nanotechnology, bioengineering materials, and so forth. So those are just a few examples. Um, on the advising side, you know, we assist students with course selection and registration. Uh, definitely when you um, onboard as a new student, uh, it takes time to know our web registration um, system through MyUSC. So as advisors, we assist you with navigating that. Uh, we also process um, your departmental clearances to enroll in classes, which, which means we give you permission so that you can add the courses online. We double check to see if, you know, you've met any prerequisites, if those conditions are there. Uh, we monitor your GPA very closely just to make sure that you're adhering to a 3.0 um, every semester. Um, we assist you on, on ways to how to get involved at USC, whether that's through the Viterbi Graduate Student Association or various student organizations within the Morick uh, Family Department. And we definitely, I would say we assist you with connecting the dots 
as far as research is concerned, how to get acclimated with different uh, faculty like Dr. Vashista and other faculty members, depending on your research goals. So oftentimes as academic advisors, we uh, serve as a starting point um, for you to get acclimated to the Mort family department. Uh, just a quick overview with chemical engineering. So there's 28 units that are required total. We kind of touched on this earlier. A 3.0 is required. Um, there's basically two different groups of classes. So you have your required core classes, uh, which is a total of 16 units. And then you have your elective courses. So these core classes, you know, they're, they're required, they're set in stone. All chemical engineering students have to do this. Um, with elective courses, there's definitely more flexibility. So there's um, suggested electives that you can do here. But at the same time, if you wanted to kind of venture out of the chemical engineering bubble, maybe take some classes in like, um, you know, that are at the undergraduate level at chemical engineering, whether that's in biochemical, nanotechnology or sustainable, um, that's a possibility. As a graduate chemical engineering student, um, you're only allowed to apply nine undergraduate units towards um, your chemical engineering degree. And you can always tell when a class is um, at the undergraduate level, if it's at, at the 400 level, if it's uh, technically classified as a graduate level course, that means it's 500 level or higher. Um, uh, graduate students aren't able to apply a 300 level course um, towards their chemical engineering degree. Um, at least in the past, what would uh, generally happen is some students are given offers of admission to the chemical engineering master's program, but if they didn't earn a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering, in that case, what ends up happening is you may have to take deficiency courses to kind of catch up just to make sure that you persist at the graduate level. Um, so deficiency courses, I would say, are in the 300 level range. Um, those particular classes, you're not able to apply those units towards your master's degree. Again, those are kind of preliminary classes that not all students have to take, but in certain cases, if you didn't earn a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering, but you are admitted to the program, you may have to take those. Um, if you uh, happen to receive an admission letter where that's a clause regarding deficiency courses, uh, please let me know. I'm happy to kind of clarify that for you and go over like what specific classes you have to take, et cetera. But at the 400 level, um, you're definitely able to take those classes and apply them towards elective space as well, if you'd like. Um, if you wanted to do any other 400 level class, whether that's like a material science, petroleum, math science, or any other engineering field, that's a possibility, but uh, we would just need to go ahead and double check with Dr. Malmstead on that as well. Um, these are examples of non-chemical engineering courses that could be applied towards the elective space for chemical engineering. So you definitely have your material science classes that are listed here. And there's also a cluster of petroleum engineering courses that you could apply as well. Uh, again, if there's anything specific that's not on this list, um, yes, just let me know and we can definitely kind of have that discussion, um, you know, in a separate advising meeting to go over that. These are um, suggested electives that you could do that are not in the Mork family department. So these are specific to uh, mechanical engineering, biomedical, civil engineering, and industrial systems engineering as well. Um, just because we always have students that kind of want to venture out, uh, um, again, of, of the Mork family department, and that is possible, and these are recommended electives. If there's anything that's outside of this list, again, just let me know, and, and that's a discussion that we can, we can have in a future meeting. Um, these are examples of uh, classes that could be applied towards a material science degree. So similar to chemical engineering, 28 units total are required. Um, you do have your core classes, which you have to take. So um, you just have to make sure that you complete 12 units total from this specific list here. So uh, they range from uh, MASC 471, which is actually cross-listed as electrical engineering 471 applied quantum mechanics, um, to material science MASC 551, which is mechanical behavior. Uh, so again, it doesn't have to be all these classes as long as it's 12 units from this specific core list. Um, and then you also have electives that you have to um, complete in order to meet the difference of 28, uh, to reach your goal of 28 units towards your uh, master's in material science. Um, so the electives are listed here. So it really just depends on um, what you would like to do. Um, but basically you could take electives either from this list here or from this specific list. If you notice the list to the left um, has classes that just pertain to material science only. Um, the list to the right are um, electives that pertain outside of more similar to chemical engineering, right? Where you could do classes in like civil, electrical engineering, 
um, you know, um, mechanical engineering, astronautical, et cetera. So there's different options that you could do here as well. Uh, conversely, for our materials engineering students, there's not really a core list of classes that you have to take. There's a little bit more flexibility as far as materials engineering is concerned. So for our materials engineering students, you would basically either do, it's 28 units total. So if you wanted to just have a focus of material science courses, you could take 28 units from this list, um, or you could do 20 units from this specific list of material science courses, and then take eight units um, from this list to the right of courses that are outside of MORC. Uh, so it's really up to you. So that's why it's kind of phrased this way for materials engineering students, where you could do you know, tw uh, 20 units at minimum from this list and then eight units here, or you could do all 28 units from this list. So it really just depends on what you like to do. Again, um, for electives, if you're a materials engineering student, if you want to do an elective that's not listed here, please just let me know. Um, I would be kind of a liaison between you and Dr. Namor and kind of talk that out and see if that's a class that you could apply, um, you know, towards a materials engineering degree. I would say if it was something that was, you know, kind of totally not related to the materials degree, like sometimes I have students ask me if they could apply Marshall School of Business courses or computer science. That might be um, a little bit of a stretch. I mean, you do have to kind of make a connection between the elective that you want to take and the master's program that you're enrolled in, right? Like if it's an industrial systems course or mechanical engineering, especially, there could be a tie-in, you know, with the materials engineering degree. So it's it's really not that much of a, a, a of a climb that you'd have to do to get that petition approved. Um, but definitely, um, you would just touch base with me first so that we can have a conversation about it. Um, and then we can kind of go from there. So this is just an overview of our newest program, pretty exciting stuff, our materials engineering machine learning uh, uh, degree. Um, so students who are in this uh, program, when you earn your master's, it'll say that you have a master's in materials engineering, but on the transcript itself, it'll say that the emphasis is, is in machine learning. So I, I do wanna take a moment to explain that. Um, there are core requirements for the degree. So it's a little different than materials engineering. So all uh, machine learning students have to make sure that they uh, complete these 12 units and these courses that are listed here. Um, and then you also have to make sure that you complete um, your elective courses. So it could be um, eight to 16 units from this specific list here. So it, again, it just really depends on what you like to do. And there's additional engineering electives that we have listed here outside of the Moore Family Department. So as you can see, there's kind of similarities between like material science, materials engineering, and materials engineering machine learning. So there's flexibility in all three. Um, yes, you could do electives that are outside of the Mork family department from other engineering fields, but if there's a class that's not on any specific list for any of these programs, you do have to let me know so I could touch base with the faculty advisor and we can have kind of a more prolonged discussion about that. Uh, for petroleum engineering, and I'm so sorry that I'm kind of <laughs> taking up a bulk of the time here in the presentation, I promise I'm almost done. Uh, for petroleum, <laughs> Um, so there's a, a couple of different slides that we have to go through. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm having trouble kind of seeing my slides because the Zoom, oh, there you go, let me just move this. <laughs> the Zoom bar was at the top. But this is for the, the standard petroleum track. Um, so for this particular program, <clears throat> there's uh, 19 units that you have to complete of core classes listed here. So all six courses are required. Um, there is an elective uh, cluster of classes that you do have to complete, so nine to 10 units uh, total listed here. And then um, there's also a deficiency section, so that's similar to chemical engineering for students who don't have a bachelor's in petroleum, but you're admitted to um, the master's degree in, in petroleum engineering. You may have like a condition on your admission letter where you have to complete deficiency courses. So those classes cannot be applied towards your master's degree, but they're preliminary classes that you have to complete. So like if anyone has that condition on their um, admission letter, uh, you know, feel free to ask me any questions about that and I'm happy to go over that. In total, it's 28 to 29 units. We say 28 to 29 because some of the classes are three units each, some of them are four. Um, we're still going through this transition where we're converting three unit classes um, to four units. Um, so that's something that, you know, we're currently kind of, we kind of have under construction as a department, I would say. Uh, but that's basically why it says 28 to 29 units for the petroleum degree. Um, sorry, give me one second. Okay, 
There's also a petroleum digital oil field technologies on emphasis. This is fairly new. It used to be called the smart oil field technologies uh, program, but they recently changed it to digital oil field. Um, and uh, for this particular degree, um, you know, there's 19 units of core classes that you have to take. Students are required to take a specialization course that you choose here. Um, and then you choose two other classes from this list. Um, there's also an elective space here where you have to complete two courses total from this list. And again, um, there are deficiency courses that are listed here for anyone who didn't earn a bachelor's degree in petroleum. Um, we also have, sorry, let me just move the menu bar again. Um, our degree in petroleum engineering, engineering management. Um, so this one is a bit um, unit heavy. Um, it's 36 units total. Um, there's a required list of core classes that you have to take here, and then there's elective courses as well that you could take um, from our previous list of electives that we had in our um, previous petroleum slide. So it's nine units total there. Um, so 36 units of core classes, I should say, and nine units of elective courses for a 45 unit total in petroleum engineering, engineering management, just so that you know. Um, sorry, give me one second. Okay. And we also have our petroleum geoscience technologies track. Um, so this consists of 38 to 39 units total, um, 19 units of core classes are required. And then you have specialization courses that are listed here as well. Um, there are um, classes at the master's level that are connected with our distance education network um, through Viterbi School of Engineering. So there are like DEN options that are offered across all of our master's level programs, I would say the program that utilizes um, the DEN network the most is petroleum engineering because we have a lot of students in Saudi Arabia who are uh, pursuing kind of professional opportunities. And so, it, you know, um, there's a partnership there where they're able to take courses through DEN, which are all online lectures. Um, I know that for any master's level student who is attending classes in person, if you have like a special circumstance, um, there are unique cases where you're able to take DEN lectures, but there's, there definitely are no blanket approvals for our in-person students. The expectation is for, for students who are not in DEN, uh, who are not part of the DEN network, excuse me, to take uh, classes in person in the classroom. But again, if there's any unique circumstances, um, you know, with prolonged issues with securing your visa as an international student or anything like that, um, those are petitions that the DEN, uh, DEN office can assist with, but I don't want to kind of bore you with too many details. I feel like I'm at the Oscars and that music is playing in the background, so I'll kind of hurry up. Um, but these are uh, specialized procedures on how to request declarance from DEN, which we don't have to go into now. That'll be more for the orientation. Um, but um, there's other additional steps as far as course registration is concerned, which again, I think that's more of a conversation that we'll table for when you attend the summer orientation. Um, but these are just kind of screenshot examples of how our classes are displayed on the schedule of classes. So, um, you know, if, if you do, um, you know, accept the terms of admission at USC, you know, this is something that you'll become familiar with uh, where you're accessing the schedule of classes. You will request departmental clearance to the department and we'll assist you with that. Um, I, I don't know, Jessica, if you want me to go over this or. Um, actually, we have a couple of questions. Oh, okay. I'll stop so if you don't mind, I can address them to you <laughs> and then we can move on to the student panel. Does that sound good? OK, um, a question that that we get pretty often is whether there um, are opportunities for master's students to either become teaching or research assistants. Um, does that opportunity exist slash are there any honors tracks or programs within chemical engineering? Um, at the master's level, they do not really have like an honors program um, and teaching and research research assistantships are actually reserved for our PhD students because that's basically how they secure their funding for their tuition. Um, graduate students are often recruited as graders um, for undergraduate level courses. So depending on, you know, your academic or research experience, um, you might be eligible to apply for a greater position that way. Uh, but under a conventional set, a sense, excuse me, TA and RA ships are reserved for PhD students. Okay, great. Thank you. And then if someone is interested in pursuing a PhD after their master's program, do you have any advice for them on how they can set themselves up for that? 
Well, actually, um, there are current master's students who apply for PhD programs, so that is possible. You don't necessarily have to wait until after you earn your master's degree. But one important thing to keep in mind is just kind of um, the fact that it's very competitive. And so if you're thinking of applying as a current master's student, um, you know, definitely things that they look out for are kind of like your research um, experience. So you definitely want to mention that like in your CV, your personal statements, letters of recommendation from past professors. You're going to be cultivating uh, relationships with faculty as a current master's level student. I mean, so it's important to build a rapport. Um, there are directed research opportunities that you could pursue at the master's level where you're not necessarily getting paid for that, but you're getting academic credit. And that could be applied towards your elective space for your master's program. So at the same time, while you're getting academic credit for that at the master's level, you could definitely kind of talk about that breadth of experience when you're applying for the PhD program. So that would be helpful. I would say try to get connected, try to get acclimated with faculty, visit them during office hours, Take a look at their publications, take a look at their research websites, um, align yourself with uh, faculty that share your research goals, get involved with student organizations, build a peer network, all those things are super important. Excellent, thank you. I think um, we can move on to the student panel. If okay, you can. Yeah. no problem. And if anyone has any questions in the meantime, um, please feel free to enter them into the Q&A box and we'll do our best to address them. Would you like me to stop sharing just because that okay? Sure, yeah. Just really quick um, for our panelists, this is our uh, department email address. So if you just wanna jot that down, feel free to send us any questions as well directly. And I'm so sorry to run on with the presentation. <laughs> Not at all, that was so helpful. Okay. <laughs> I'll provide it again later in the chat. <laughs> Um, so I'm sorry, how does this work? So am I asking? <laughs> yes, yes, Anthony, if you feel comfortable okay. introducing our, our student and alumni panelists, and then we'll just pose the questions to them. Okay, awesome. Well, um, I'll give the panelists an opportunity, um, you know, if you folks just want to take a moment to introduce yourselves. Um, Elena, I see you we could start with you first, if you could just say your name, current major, um, <laughs> you know, um, any other like uh, tidbits of information you'd like to share with the group. Yes, I can. Hello, everyone. My name is Elena Kiocha, and I am a chemical engineering major at USC, undergraduate with the petroleum emphasis, also working on my um, master's in digital oil flow technologies at the same time. So I am, a, I think I'm at the last end of my second semester of my master's degree. And uh, just a little tidbit about me is I'm also like a Viterbi undergraduate student ambassador. And I chose USC because USC gave me the opportunity to major in both chemical and petroleum engineering at the same time within my undergrad with the emphasis program, which is something that I wanted to do. Thank you, Lena. Hi, Jacob. <laughs> Hi there, Anthony. Uh, I apologize. I'm actually in New York City right now with my family traveling. So I have to kind of <laughs> walk and while talking here. But yeah, uh, my name is Jacob. I graduated last semester with my bachelor's and master's degrees, both in chemical engineering. Um, I, like Elena, was a Viterbi student ambassador while I was there. I was also involved with the American Institute of Chemical Engineers uh, undergraduate research. Just a lot of the nice things that Viterbi has to offer. So I'm happy to speak to any of those things now. Oh, and I'm now working as an engineer in the Los Angeles area. At SpaceX, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, awesome. All right, just wanted to share that. Yeah. <laughs> just a small yeah. little company, you know, like no big deal. Yeah. Yeah, a little startup, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, well, thank you both. Uh, one of the questions I had just to get started, and, and I know, Jacob, uh, you're kind of uh, uh, on your way out, so I'll start with you. Um, what were some of the essential resources that kind of led to your success as a student um, that you'd like to share with um, our perspective and new students that are coming in to, to Viterbi? Yeah, I've, that's actually a question that I've, I think I got before on a panel and I've thought about. I think that oh. hands down, I would answer the professors. I feel that USC's kind of just the right size. Like if you go to a large state school, um, it's harder to find one-on-one -on -one time with faculty. A lot of TAs are teaching the classes. Whereas if you go to like a smaller school, uh, the professors know you, but it's a really narrow community. Whereas I think Viterbi being small, but USC being big, you really get the best of both worlds there. And I thought that that was very helpful. Like professors, if I put in an effort, like knew my name and they would talk to me during office hours about not just how, how to do the homework, but about um, just mentorship and figuring out if I would like to 
go to industry or do a PhD or what I am mo most interested in within the field, just a lot of stuff like that. I think there were really good mentors and that was, yeah, definitely the number one thing that helped me. Professors Malmstead and Sharada, especially. I'm very indebted to them. Oh, okay, cool. Thank you for the name drops there, appreciate it. Uh, Elena, um, what resources would you like to share that, that are kind of making you successful or helping you kind of build that model to, to thrive and, and mark? I would definitely say my peers because engineering is hard, chemical engineering is especially hard, you know? So just being able to like work because um, USC's chemical engineering is more altruistic. We're able to work in groups for our group projects. Even homework is encouraged to work in groups. And so just having a good study group, like working with your classmates because there is, there's not that many of us, it really kind of brings in camaraderie and it makes you feel not alone. So if you're spending like six hours on a homework problem, if you phone a friend or you just ask a group member, you're more likely to get an answer than just struggling on it by yourself for six to seven hours. I love that. Thank you very much. And that's one of the things I brought up earlier in the presentation that, you know, again, we're, we're a small community at Mork, but our students are very united. Uh, they make an effort to stay connected to form their own study groups. Um, and so I just, I really appreciate that. Having worked at USC for over 13 years, I've never been part of an academic unit where there was this um, unity with, with students. Um, you know, oftentimes at a big university, like Jacob was saying, alluding to kind of sometimes you kind of feel like disconnected or maybe siloed or it's hard to get in touch with faculty or students. It's really not the case in our department. Our faculty is very accessible, as is Dr. Vashista for being present with us today. Um, our students form a very uh, tight alliance. And so th that's something to consider, you know, when when kind of looking at various schools and, and possibly other admission offers is, you know, thinking about the community that, that you could build and, and add to here as a student in the more family department. Thank you. Um, let's see. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, sorry. Go ahead, Jessica. Oh, no, you're great. I just noticed a question that I think would be great sure. to, to pose to both of you as well. Um, in terms of your preparation for industry, maybe Jacob, as a recent graduate that's already working, could you maybe share how the program prepared you to be successful in your current job? Um, someone's asking in particular, if they graduate without having a lot of work experience, does it set them back a lot in, in the employment search afterwards? Yeah, um, I, I think that, well, I'm kind of like, I was in that situation. So my internship experience was in oil and gas, but I only did two internships. So one was virtual. So we'll count that as one and a half, I guess. Um, they're all in oil and gas and now I'm working in like aerospace. So it's completely unrelated. I was kind of in the boat of not having a ton of experience in that area. And I think, I mean, it certainly helps, but it's by no means prohibitive to not even have access to those things. I think that uh, just having something that you can speak to, like to demonstrate that you used critical thinking or are good at solving complex problems and just systems analysis. Like, I think I use more examples from classes or for research that I did at, at USC than I did from internships that I completed elsewhere. I think just yeah, being able to talk, <laughs> engineering is about solving unsolvable problems and just coming up with a solution that's good enough and that you can back up. So I think having examples of having done that in the courses that we take, the projects that we do, especially the a lot of the graduate courses that are project-based. And yeah, I think that prepared me very well and were things that I was able to speak to in interviews and hopefully prepared me for working. I think they did. Awesome, thank you. Elena, did you have a chance to uh, participate in any internships or career events? Could you share your experience with that? Yes, I can. Um, so I think was it last summer I had my first internship? My summer for my senior year, it's like my junior year. And I worked for um, California, Re uh, California Resources Corporation, which is an oil and gas company in the state of California. And I was able to directly apply my petroleum classes that I took in my undergrad to my job. So just like analyzing well logs, just kind of understanding subsurface reservoirs. And it, it, was, it was a literal direct, direct translation from class to like what I was doing as a reservoir engineer that I actually sent my professor like a thank you. I was like, sir, you taught me about all of these mechanics, you taught me about the equipment, and it was just something I was appreciative because I wasn't lost in my first internship, which was something that I thought was extremely helpful. But just as like Jacob said, I also have friends that, um, that did internships just in different categories, and they were able to just kind of apply a way of thinking. I found like engineering, as Jacob said, is problem solving. It's being able to solve things in a different way that can be applied to many different fields. And that's something that like, I'm also trying to do by just branching onto other fields, as well as just the oil and gas. 
Um, and just also kind of to piggyback off of what Alina and Jacob mentioned, another thing I wanted to bring up was um, our department, we're currently, um, you know, trying to improve our um, marketing as far as different professional development opportunities are concerned across our programs. We recently just started an Instagram where we're sharing out like internship leads, different events. Um, you know, we're kind of um, improving our communication with our student orgs. Aki has an awesome job board uh, for Kenny students. And so um, we're, we're kind of sharing that as a Google Doc, bouncing ideas back and forth, sharing that out with all of our current students. Um, again, just to kind of uh, bridge the gaps and promote um, different opportunities for our current students as well. We have uh, one of our current um, master's level Kenny students who is an ambassador at the Turby um, Career Connections as well. So um, that's kind of a breakthrough also that hasn't happened in a while. So now that we have a student, you know, who kind of has that um, academic experience and he has that connection, he's sharing some uh, professional resources with us. So we're super appreciative of that. I would just like to invite our audience, if you have any other questions for Jacob or Alina, please go ahead and enter it into the Q&A. I guess, you know, while, while people are thinking of their questions, I'm curious when you both were in the position to choose USC or maybe another school, what was it that you drew you to USC? And yeah, just go from there. <laughs> yeah, I, I can try and speak to that. Um... I think it's similar to how I answered the first question. Like I was kind of, <laughs> there's, I was deciding actually between a large state school, a small STEM school and USC. I think the reason that what appealed me to USC was not just like the size factors so that uh, like the professors have time for you and it's a small community within a large community. But I think USC really doesn't force you to give anything up. So if I, if I had gone to a school that was smaller and that was directly focused on STEM, then I feel like I would have lost out on being, I mean, even though we are like graduate students, you, it's still nice to be able to interact with people who are doing like other things besides STEM. It's a really powerful community to be a part of at USC and just in the greater Los Angeles area. And I think that that's been really helpful just in my development as a whole human being, not just as an engineer who can do really good calculus, but as someone who can, uh, can uh, I mean, you can go to the opera at USC, you can see movies that are screened for the first time at a world-class film school. And I think it's very helpful and just being developed as a well-rounded person and then like couple that with the academics and with the professors and faculty and it kind of felt like a no-brainer at the end of the day i was happy with my decision and then for me um actually committed to another school i'm from the east coast so going to high school i was like from the first graduating class of my high school so I, we didn't really have like um guidance counselors so everything i did for college i kind of did by myself like with my friend group and so uh, for USC, I actually flew down and I met with the USC like, Viterbi Student Ambassador, which is kind of why I actually became a Viterbi Student Ambassador, just to kind of share my experiences and help just students realize that USC is, can be their dream school, even if they don't know that it is their dream school, because that was kind of what happened with me. And so just like, as Jacob said, when I came onto campus, there were so many different majors, so many different options. And just knowing that I wanted to be an engineer, but I know that like, I am also, a, I'm a person, I'm a student, I have other interests and that USC just kind of allowed me to pursue that. And I know that within Viterbi, we call that um, our engineering plus, just kind of showing that outside of just being engineer students, we're musicians, we're dancers, we're artists, you know, we're whatever else we want to be in addition to being an engineer. And that's just something that USC allowed me to be. So like at USC, I'm involved in like two club sports. I'm involved in intramural sports. I'm very much like a, a college student. I'm an engineer as well as an athlete. And sometimes I take vocal classes on the side. And it's just the diversity of what you can do in addition to getting your degree that made me like ultimately switch. I uncommitted from another school and committed to USC. And so it was something that I just felt like I've never regretted my decision since. It just makes me feel at home, even with the people that I interact with. That's incredible. <laughs> um, Jacob, were you also involved in other activities outside of class? It sounds like you definitely make, made the most of being in LA and all the events at USC. Were you part of any student organizations as well? Yeah, actually, I was involved in AGI for the American Institute of Chemical Engineers for all four years that I was an undergrad. I, I ended up serving as the president my senior year, which again, so because of COVID, limited capacity. But yeah, I think that was really helpful. Um, being involved in, I don't know, like having a say in the professional development or academic development culture that we like to provide to the fellow students was really nice. 
uh, and being involved in undergraduate research as well, where both things are really enjoyed. Great. I, I know we only have five minutes left, so I just wonder if you want to leave any parting words, any last advice for incoming students, something maybe you wish you knew when you started your program? Uh, we can start with you, Alina, if you want. Um, I have me when I started my program, because I'm kind of in a hybrid situation where I'm an undergraduate, but I'm also a master's student as well. And I would just say like, just working through it is definitely don't overload yourself. Cause I know like with me, like I'm taking three master's courses, but I'm still also taking a couple undergraduate courses as well. And it's a lot. So it's just more of like knowing your, your time commitments, knowing that these are like intensive like courses. Like they do require time. They require you to spend like hours outside of class to maybe figure out a new like computer program or figure out how to like solve something. And so it's just like knowing that you shouldn't overload yourself. There's a reason why we have like the minimum like requirements for like graduate students, whether it's like nine to 12 and like stay within that range if you, like, yeah, if you have like the, the, the opportunity to. Yeah, I think what I totally agree with everything Elena was saying. Uh, one thing, another, that I also found out kind of too late was I didn't realize the value in making friends with the upperclassmen. So I think uh, at least my experience there as an undergraduate, I think that I, not until my sophomore year did I really start talking to upperclassmen that are older than me, making friends with them. And it's not just useful in, oh, like recommending what professors you should take classes from or what professors you maybe shouldn't, like what's difficult and what's not. It was also just really valuable and like, for lack of a better word, I mean like role models, like no matter how hard it gets like, at any given moment, some of the years and semesters are way harder than others. It's nice to see that there are people who have made it through, who have had the same like doubts that you have and who have decided to stick with it. But there are, it's nice to have that motivation and inspiration. Like obviously there are good reasons for what you're doing and you will be well rewarded at the end of the tunnel. So yeah, I'm really glad that I stayed with chemical engineering. Thank you so much for that. I, I know it's a cheesy line, but we do say Trojans care for Trojans. And I think it's very true um, at USC, definitely within the student base, faculty, staff, the alumni, the whole thing. Um, so I, I just want to thank all of you again for your time to our panelists, to Professor Vashishta, to Anthony, um, and to our, our future Trojans that have joined us today. We hope we got to answer your questions. I want to allow both Anthony and Professor Vashishta to also give some closing words before we, we end this presentation. Anthony, do you want to go? Okay. Um, well, yes, I, I know it was a lot of information definitely in the slides. <laughs> we don't expect everyone to memorize everything. Um, but as advisors, you know, um, again, if, if you decide to make the decision to come to USC, we'll guide you every step of the way. Um, you know, we're more than happy to assist you along your academic and professional journey and just connecting with essential faculty, essential resources, and making sure that you're a successful Trojan. So I, we hope to see you in the fall. And uh, Dr. Vashista, please well, take it away. This is a good place to come. You will enjoy being here. And uh, you have heard people say the nice things in the sense of personal experience and academic experience, and that's all you want in life. You want a good personal experience and you want a good academic training, and you will have it here and you will enjoy it. Okay? So make a decision and decide to come. <laughs> the right decision. <laughs> but yes, thank you all. Thank you so much. We're excited to welcome you to USC this fall. Bye, Don. Okay. Thank you all. Bye. Yeah.